and gentlemen, our next speaker. For many of you, doesn't need an introduction. He's an electrical engineer. He's been a scientist, research physicist. He's named after one of the greats in history. In fact, uh, he'll even tell you that, that he was, uh, his uh, first name, Morey, was named after T. Henry Morey. Uh, he's got some fabulous books out here, The Energy Machine of T. Henry Morey, and uh, uh, this is written by Morey King. Uh, today, we are honored and privileged to have him, uh, and uh, he's uh, uh, talking about uh, a subject that's near and dear to my heart, and uh, this gentleman, uh, is, is no stranger to, uh, he's we're truly a renaissance man for all the facets of every type of technology that we've had the honor and the privilege of having, not just here at Tesla Tech, but for those of you who were around back then, the International Symposium on New Energy, I'd like to give you, I'd like to give a warm welcome to Maury King. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, there's a correction. I was not named after uh, T. Henry Moray. John Moray actually confronted my mother in 1978. We had him come out to a conference, and he uh, asked my mother, how did you come to name a Moray with, with the identical spelling? And I never thought to ask that. I was Moray all, all my life. So uh, she, she gave him the answer, and she said she was attempting to name uh, me after her father and her mother at the same time. So my grandfather's nickname was Mo, and my mother's name was Rachel. Her nickname was Ray. She concatenated the two syllables together, and she didn't know about the Moray eel, so she just spelled it Moray. And I said, that's interesting. Then later on, I found out there was a song about my name. Uh, if an eel lunges out and it bites off your snout, that's a Moray. <laughs> Well, it's been magical for me ever since. John, can we get the slideshow? John? Slideshow, please. The question is, how can energy, so much energy, be stored coherently in water? to make water appear to be a fuel. Could you turn that off? OK, thank you. Uh, we're, go we're going to the slideshow, and we'll do the next slide. I want this time back. <laughs> he gives it back to me. We do this every year. Thank you very much. So uh, we're going to explore that. There's a cavitating electrolyzer. It's the key to overunity. Here, overunity means we recognize it. there's another energy source involved that most people don't recognize. And here it's going to be uh, on a simple device that many inventors have done. It's very popular. It's called HHO. It stands for atomic hydrogen and oxygen. Yul Brown came up with that, trying to explain the anomalies behind the of uh, these electrolyzers. Uh, what we're going to show, it's really a zero-point energy device, and we're going to trap energy in the water. And the way to do that and the way to make it way better is to cavitate the water and circulate the water. If you get anything from this lecture, it's that. That's the best thing to make these devices better. Cavitating the water activates and coheres zero-point energy. We're going to see how. Circulating the water creates turbulence for more cavitation, electrostatic charging by rubbing, and builds up the energy content as it integrates through as you keep recirculating the water. The feature invented is Marc Leclerc. He's a mechanical engineer, expert in fluid dynamics and cavitation. He probably has the simplest element transmutation experiment ever done. Uh, he discovered a microscopic water crystal that comes from cavitation that has an extraordinary energy density. Leclerc's water crystal has similarities to Ken Shoulder's plasmoid structures. He called EVs or EVOs when he was convinced that they extracted their energy from the vacuum. And likewise, the plasmoid strikes of the Russian work and the, and the Ukrainians, uh, Avdomenko's team, showed that strikes from these plasmoids exhibit, all exhibit element transmutation. And I saw the similarities in all three of, of their work. We're going to explain 
where the energy comes from in Brown's gas. It's not from burning hydrogen. It's rather it's coming from a charged water cluster that declares microscopic water crystal stabilizes in a ring form. Sterling Allen, uh, who's with us today, uh, confided to me that he wanted to make the best website on this new energy topic a few years ago. And Don, if he hasn't done so already, I think he pulled it off. Let's give him a hand. Shortly after my first presentation, he made this very short video that succinctly summarizes all the anomalies and the controversy around these electrolyzers. So I'd like to play that to get everybody introduced to the topic. Can water provide the fuel of the future? While academia has been spurning the topic, hundreds if not thousands of hobbyists and independent investigators worldwide are working on various electrolysis-like projects which put out more energy than was required to run the electrolysis unit. These pursuits go by various names such as Brown's gas and water fuel cells and have various heroes such as the late Stanley Meyer and more recently John Kansas who is burning salt water using radio frequencies. A number of commercial interests are involved in the research and development of the various approaches as well. The famous 19th century scientist Michael Faraday defined the limit of output energy possible in any standard electrolysis scenario. It is well known in thermodynamics that it takes more energy to dissociate water into hydrogen and oxygen than can be returned when the hydrogen is burned. But these rogue experimenters of today are reporting output from their setups that exceed Faraday's limit many times over, claiming seven times, ten times, or even more, producing as much as one liter of gas per hour using just a half a watt of electricity. The factors that seem to contribute to these effects include using a large number of stainless plates close together, the plates rough to facilitate releasing the bubbles, driving the cell using square waves, pulsed DC at kilohertz frequencies, and constantly modifying the frequency to optimize gas production. Moray King, who has published three seminal books on zero-point energy, recently put forth a scientific model in which he suggests that the excess energy being observed in these unusual electrolysis setups comes from the zero-point energy by producing charged water gas clusters, which somehow achieve a self-organizing criticality that coherently activates and absorbs zero-point energy. The experimental setups are typically rather simple, which is leading to a proliferation of the number of people reproducing and working to improve the effect and its consistency to the point where it can be used to serve as a practical primary energy source, an energy generator that could operate anywhere there is water. Zero point energy is everywhere in the universe. It is the foundation of the fabric of space. Other groups, such as Exogen Technologies, are using these processes to purify water. These energy sources could actually produce culinary water as a byproduct. The day of water power via zero-point energy is arriving. Welcome to the future. Thanks. Um, if you Google HHO, you'll get all sorts of hits on people playing around with these projects. They're very, very popular. This is the summer games uh, down in Florida where there's a big tent and everybody comes to show off their wares. If you Google HOHOHO, don't, don't bother because I tried it. You get the Santa Claus site. <laughs> there's over 41 thousand videos people are putting up on YouTube showing their experiments with this, typically hobbyists. Uh, there's commercial units for sale. Best is known for doing these big units for welding applications coming out of South Korea. Bob Voice is very famous for, de for developing these electrolyzers. He actually succeeded in getting a car engine to run, self-running without the battery. 
Uh, he's done more to spread the information and has created more hobbyists than anyone else. He was here a few years ago. Uh, the, there's lots of kits for sale. They, typical dry cells is what they call were separated by gaskets. The Anton cell is very good with a very small gap. We're going to see why a small gap is, is important. Uh, the Anton cell also feeds water from the bottom, making it ideal for circulation experiments. In the wiring, when all the plates are wired, they call that the wet cell because everything's immersed. Mainly, the edges of the cell are exposed to the water. Typically, they run between 4 volts between the cell. You only need about 1.3 for electrolysis, but you have to overcome the resistance of the stainless steel and other parts of the circuit. Uh, when a dry cell, when you use gaskets, you can let some of the plates float because they'll get charged by polarization on the equal potential surfaces. So you only need to typically you end up with four volts between the plates. Denny Klein's video uh, summarizes best the uh, strange properties of Brown's gas. So I like to play this to introduce it to people who haven't seen it before. Turn the machine on. Denny Klein fires up his hot new invention. His machine emits a flame that feels only slightly warm to the touch. But watch what happens when he touches anything else. Instantaneously, I can burn a hole right down through the center of that brick. The flame instantly turns hotter than the surface of the sun. Heat so intense it takes only seconds to literally burn a hole through charcoal. Three seconds turns a brass ball to glowing liquid metal. Tungsten lights up like a sparkler. Steel, lead, and other metal slices on contact. Yet the tip of the welder stays cool to the touch. No other gas will, will do this. Denny Klein uses an alternative fuel source once thought impossible. He says people still have trouble believing him when he reveals his liquid fuel. Water. Take water and electricity and we break it down through our uh, very unique electrolysis process. Klein has just patented his process of converting H2O to HHO producing a gas that combines the atomic power of hydrogen with the chemical stability of water. It turns right back to water. You can see the water running off of this. Klein originally designed his water-burning engine for cutting metal. He thought his invention would replace volatile acetylene in welding factories. And then one day, as he drove to his laboratory in Clearwater, he thought of another way to burn his HHO gas. On a 100-mile trip, uh, we use about four ounces of water. Klein says his prototype 1994 Ford Escort can travel exclusively on water, though he currently has it rigged to run as a water and gasoline hybrid. Simply uh, speaking, we can change the world by reducing our dependence on fossil fuels. These are equivalent to our... Uh... Pete Dominici is helping Klein take his hydrogen technology patents from a two-room office in Clearwater to consumer markets around the world. You know what? Microsoft came out of nowhere, came out of the garage. Why not hydrogen technologies? The duo is already in negotiations with one U.S. automaker and the U.S. government. Their plans have grown from basic welding with water to powering the entire world from the safest and cleanest fuel on Earth. Craig Patrick, Fox News. Members of Congress recently invited Denny Klein to Washington to demonstrate his technology. Now his company is currently developing a Hummer for the U.S. military that can run on both water and gasoline. So far, his water-powered engines have passed all performance safety inspections, so all systems appear to be go right now and gives new meaning to the term running water. You just have to hope that water prices don't go up like <laughs> Nearly everyone believes the energy is from hydrogen. Here we're going to propose the energy is not from hydrogen, and we're going to use the big anomalies around Brown's gas. It's a cool flame, yet it vaporizes tungstens. There's claims that it can alter radioactivity of radioactive material or cause element transmutation. Burning hydrogen certainly cannot do that. Furthermore, laboratory analysis shows there's little hydrogen in Brown's gas, and instead, there's gaseous charged water clusters. I compared the, those clusters to, this, to, Ken, to uh, Ken Shoulder's work on the, his plasma charge clusters. 
And there was a class of self-organization in the matter ZPE conglomerate. That's the, that's the, the thesis of my work, that this actually occurs in plasmas. Now we can get it to occur in water. Uh, Ken Shoulders shows it in a microscopic form of ball lightning that he calls EVs or EVOs. The ball lightning is a plasmoid form. It typically forms the vortex ring form that's an archetype for energy trapping. Uh, it's a natural stability. It's a force-free vortex that closes on itself. It's naturally stable as a vortex ring. Uh, the experiment's very simple. He takes a capacitor where he knows his charge, very abruptly discharges it, and launches a small, tiny, micron-sized bead of ball lightning. And then when it hits the wetness plate, it, uh, it creates craters. Way more energy is dissipated than what he put on the capacitor. Uh, he measured that uh, these charged clusters contain about 10 to the 11th electrons, 10 to the 6 ions. The charge to mass ratio is like the electrons, and they contain excessive energy. Uh, they also form into necklaces, which is unusual because they kind of still attract each other, despite the fact they have uh, different charges. They bore holes in high melting point ceramics. They carve trenches. And Ken Shoulders observed that they disrupt the electron bonds uh, that makes the, the, the atoms let go in the metal. And that occurs in Brown's gas as well. It's not heat that's producing the disruption. And of course, element transmutation and radioactivity reduction just seems out of the paradigm. And yet Ken Shoulders is demonstrating that. The plasma charge clusters and the charged water clusters exhibit the same anomalies. Brown's gas is not hydrogen combustion. The energy is stored in a more coherent form. Uh, it exhibits a cool flame, just a little bit above the temperature of, of, water, of, of boiling water. People can pass their hand through the flame. Uh, they see that demonstration in Brown's gas. Furthermore, it doesn't boil water. If you just hit the flame on the water, the Brown's gas torch doesn't burn it. It doesn't boil it. Yet, it can vaporize tungsten. Tungsten melts at 6,000 degrees and vaporizes above 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. So there you have it. We have an incredibly cold torch that, that is colder than all the torches, all the standard welding torches. It can vaporize tungsten above 10,000 degrees, and no other welding torch can do it. Clearly, the energy is being stored in a coherent form. It is not heat. Burning hydrogen certainly cannot explain it. Another energetic gas is present. Here's some of the empirical evidence from uh, the hobbyists. Uh, there's the balloon test. You fill the balloon with Brown's gas. You, you wait until it falls to the ground, it vents away its hydrogen, and it still exhibits a balloon torch through a little tube. Uh, fill a paper bag, a brown paper bag with the Brown's gas, seal it up, wait about 12 hours, all the hydrogen dissipates away, you open the bag, there's a heavier than air gas that remains at the bottom of the bag, and the gas can be ignited. Furthermore, if you, you can carefully pour the gas from one glass to another and still ignite the, gla the gas at the bottom of the glass. George Weissman, a famous researcher of Brown's gas, describes in detail what he observes as this heavier than air gas burns. He says it burns like an imploding ring, about a half a second to burn down. So here's an action item for the chemistry departments and universities. Create some Brown's gas, then away the hydrogen. Does the remaining gas burn? What is it? Chris Eckman did this at Idaho State University. He was an undergraduate. He worked with the chemistry professor to work with the equipment. He detected there was little hydrogen there, di di neither diatomic or monotonic, but he would observe a gaseous water cluster of some sort without excess electrons. And he confirmed the low temperature of the flame. This is Eagle Research, is, is George Weissman's website. It's probably the, one of the best websites for information on Brown's gas. What George has observed when you first start an electrolyzer up where the plates are, are, are well separated so he can see the activity, he'll see the bubbles of hydrogen and oxygen that would be expected. But he then says, there's something that he observes that is never mentioned in any textbook 
in science. There's a middle set of bubbles forming in between. Uh, Bob Boyce made a similar observation. He says when he first starts it up, he can see these two jets colliding in the middle, being emitted from both plates right at the beginning, and they also form the middle set of bubbles. Keep the idea of colliding jets in mind. We'll be revisiting it. Seems like that's where the, the, the energetic clusters are. Uh, Sort and Gourley harvest just a middle set of bubbles. And, and they say that Brown's gas is a mixture. They, they, they treat hydrogen as a contaminant. And they just want the middle set of bubbles. They think they're the first to discover this, so they named the gas after themselves, SG gas. When they dissolve the gas in water, it still tries to get out. Here they, they uh, can catch it sometimes in ice cubes. And there's claims of health benefits and things like that for the water with the pure form of Brown's gas stored in it. So here are the anomalies. It adheres to matter. It's electrically polarized. Uh, when it implodes, it, it implodes instead of explodes and gives off an electric shock. Uh, has the cool flame, which sublimates tungsten, pretty well cuts through uh, any of the materials. Uh, there's claims of neutralizing radioactive waste and claims of element transmutation. These are completely out of the paradigm. However, Vernon Roth, presenting last year, showed also observed element transmutation. And because Vernon's with us in the audience, uh, and he shared his information so well over all these years, I think we should honor him. Thank you, Vern. Well, Mark LeClaire is our new inventor. He's going to explain how water cavitation can create the microsco microscopic craters, can carve trenches, even transmute elements and, and manifest excess energy. Sonic luminescence is well studied. In, under ultrasonic conditions, water mixed with uh, argon or xenon or other inert gases, uh, under ultrasonics, uh, emit this bluish light. This has created a lot of excitement because if that bluish light were a thermal spectrum, then people would say, holy cow, those temperatures are, are above the temperature of the sun. We could produce fusion. However, Julian Schwinger and other scientists propose, no, the abrupt scalar compression from the bubble is activating the zero point energy and converting it in, into uh, blue, blue photons. And so we're not getting as much energy. But we are getting a zero-point energy coherence, and thus we are tapping the zero-point energy. The only problem is we're dissipating all the energy as light. However, when a cavitation bubble collapses near a surface or an irregularity, it starts to dimple in and forms what's called a reentrant jet. All the energy of the collapsing water bottle bubble gets concentrated into the reentrant jet. And now we're do a concentration on the order of a nanometer. Uh, Roger Stringham recognized the advantages of this, and he proposed using it for sonofusion. This is, he's pictured on the first issue of Infinite Energy magazine, and he has some success with, with his experiments. And basically, he, the reentrant jet in deuterium injects into the target, and he thinks he can create some deuterium events. Well, they can create transmutation events as well, as we'll see. So here we are, the water, when it's near surface, dimples up, forms a torus, all the energy of the torus gets concentrated, and inside that concentrated energy at the tip are pressures over 300,000 pounds per square inch. Under these pressures, pressures a new form of solid state water can afford, and that, that's what Mar Mark LeClaire discovered, called a macro ionic water crystal. Here's a diagram that Mark drew, drew. at the front of the crystal is a plasma bow shock wave that he thinks is where the zero point energy coherence. And that is so similar to Ken Shoulder's EVOs. I think it's the same phenomena occurring because he's getting the same anomalies. Uh, Mark has four patents for controlling reentrant jets to do actual engineering with them. What he wants to do is do uh, nanotechnology to cut at the nanoscale level with these reentrant jets. So what he does is he creates a laser strike to make the bubble just above a hole. The bubble expands, and as it contracts, it launches the reentrant jet. But instead of hitting the surface, it goes through the hole and accelerates through to then cut the next, on the next surface o over. And when he lets it accelerate, it exhibits a self-acceleration phenomena 
there's way more energy, and that's where he's getting the transmutation. Well, likewise, he can use one cavitation bubble to target a second. He first makes the big bubble, then hits the laser pulse just a little bit afterwards to start the small bubble. The big bubble launches its reentrant jet first, wipes out the, the small bubble, and can target what's ever behind it. Now, Mark LeClaire is not the only one. Oh, I've got one more slide. Here's this apparatus with the laser and how, how it's set up. He's a, he's a very good mechanical engineer, and he wants uh, everybody to know about his work. Mark LeClaire is not the only one to control the reentrant jets from cavitation bubble. Check out what pistol shrimp can do. Okay. I didn't. We, we can move on. Yeah, let's just move on. You got the main point. Those are bad dudes. <laughs> yeah, let's just end it, John. Move on. So propellers are, are well known to induce cavitation. You just have to move the surface faster than 40 miles per hour, 40 miles per hour and you'll create uh, enough vacuum, low pressure, uh, to create the cavitation bubbles. And it's famous for producing the corrosion and the erosion effects, the pitting. Come, they come from the reentrant jets. Uh, the crystal that Mark proposes is a hexagonal form, and the linear axis has linear water down the axis. Uh, here's a diagram. The axis, this is just one strand in the linear water, and uh, they, the strands are connected by uh, covalent bonds, and there is a top view of the, of the water crystal. And this diagram is a 3D rendering, rep trying to represent this, uh, the crystal in three dimensions. Uh, he's able to photograph imprints. He's a, he shoots the water crystal into a rice, rust particle, and was able to make these photographs to the microscope. They were kind of pretty. Uh, they, uh, they are very fast, they tend to, and they can self-accelerate up to Mach 4. They hit with pressures over 100,000 PSI. The water crystal has a linear axis of HO, HO, HO. Uh, they're trigonal or hexagonal in shape around the peripheral. They have a positive charge at the head and a negative charge at the tail, and the plasma shock wave at the head it looks like shoulders EVO. And the critical thing is the self-acceleration. It's like propulsion. Uh, he call, Mark calls it the Leclerc effect, where this bow shock wave uh, manifests the, uh, the self-acceleration when it hits something, then it can cause nuclear reactions, just like the EVO strikes. Here's a picture of a long chain chasing its tail. The positive head is chasing the tail and is carving a trench. And here's this transmutation experiment. Uh, this is the components. There's a rolled up aluminum veneer. It has decorative holes drilled in it. And he rolls it up, puts it in the plexiglass tube. He uses a beefy pump. It's a, it's a swimming pool pump made to run at 25 uh, gallons per minute. Here it's assembled, and what he does is he, is he starves the pump right there uh, at, um, with the valve, and he starves it down to about a half a gallon per minute, and that pump makes a loud squeal between 5 and 7 kilohertz. His water bucket's about 2 feet down as he pulls, as he pulls the water up. It creates cavitation bubbles. He warns that he was sat too close to it because he was constantly adjusting the valve. And he gave himself the symptoms of radiation poisoning when he ran this experiment for a half an hour or an hour or longer. But when he unrolled the aluminum veneer, he found element transmutation on the surface. That white blotch is actually carbon in a diamond form. The big surprise was it wasn't just a simple move the aluminum nucleus to something else. He was getting nucleosynthesis. 
uh, elements all over the periodic table. He also found there were rare isotopes that you don't typically see in nature, and they tended to be multiples of the helium nucleus, which, which made him think this is very much the type of thing that happens in supernovas. Now, you might think, well, this is too far out. This is too far-fetched. How can we possibly be, believe this? Well, there's two other experiments that do the same type of thing. The plasmoid strikes also exhibits it, and the nucleosynthesis from the, from the large plasmoid strikes do it likewise. So Ken Shoulders announced it at the 10th conference on cold fusion, showing he also got nucleosynthesis all over the periodic table. And the work in the Ukraine from the Proton 21 laboratory, they have the university professors involved in this work. They take, uh, make a very pure copper target. They hit it with a plasmoid about a centimeter in size, and they get the same thing. Nucleosynthesis across, uh, all across the periodic table. This work is completely ignored in Western academia. This is probably, their experiments are probably the best transmutation experiments on the planet. They have a conference every year called uh, Cold Nuclear Transmutation and Ball Lightning that studies this phenomenon. This has been going on for 10 years, completely ignored in the West. So here's an action item for the physics department. Repeat Leclerc's transmutation experiment. Measure the new isotopes and ask colleagues to replicate. So how does cavitation relate to Brown's gas? Well, the collapsing bubble launches the reentrant jet, which creates the linear axis of uh, HO down the axis. And is there any evidence for this linear water? Well, it turns out Chris Eckman in, in his studies got some preliminary evidence at the Idaho State University. And he presented it, uh, his results at the MPA where he gets a linear, observed a linear isomer of water with extra electrons. So it could take that form. Those electrons had to be out at the new orbitals. He realized that alone would not be stable. So he suggested it's participating in a cluster like Rydberg matter. And in Rydberg matter, the, uh, the, I, the nuclei are organized in the electrons shell out at the orbital uh, orbits all of them. And, it's at a, and those electrons are at a very high energy state. So now we have a mechanism for storing a lot of energy in the water. So here we have a linear axis and uh, down th that linear water crystal, how can its energy be captured? Well, if it can close head to tail to make a ring, you could attach, uh, we could get a ring of, of this, but unfortunately, these large rings are observed to be unstable. However, they can de decay into smaller rings, very similar to uh, vortex ring decay that decays in a bunch of smaller rings. And if the rings are under a half a micron, they can be stable. So this is a simplified version. If there's just one strand around, we would have the ring. Uh, likewise, the, we could get collisions. If we have two colliding uh, water crystals, remember the colliding reentry jet, jets uh, coming at each other, they could attract head to tail. In the shear collision, it'll create a vortex. They'll start to spin. And from this collision, from the Malay comes the debris, a series of small water crystal rings. This is analogous to uh, particle collisions, where on the accelerators, when two particles collide, we get a whole spectrum of, of debris of smaller particles. This seems to be something that's similar. So there you have it. These d orbitals, we have a ring. These d orbitals are held way out to make the Rydberg matter. And when you put that, when you model it that way, you realize, wow, we have a metastable torus form. So in one model, we have George Weissman's electrically expanded water, we have Chris Eklund's linear water isomer, and we have Foster Gamble's torus form, all holding excess energy to, to explain how a huge amount of energy can be stored in Brown's gas. So Mark says when the ring breaks, if there's structure to it, like the water crystal, it could relaunch, and we have our plasma bile shock wave, and that now can interact 
and cause the transmutation. Likewise, when we're only at a half a micron in size, the water crystal ring could, when ignited, could go straight into an EVO plasmoid, just like Ken's shoulders. So what we want to do is cavitate the water in the electrolyzers. That's going to bump up the number of, of those particles and create a huge amount of extra energy compared to electrolysis. So how do we cavitate? Well, people are doing it inadvertently by, by making electrolysis gas in the tight gaps. That's why those tight gaps were so important. You can also cavitate by pulling a venturi vacuum. You can blow air through the gaps. You can oscillate an electric field. Pulse wave modulation does that. Any type of vibration, mechanical vibration, sonic and ultrasonic are well known to cavitate water. And of course, there's cavitating pumps and even vortex actions can pr produce negative pressures that cause water cavitation, cr creates the cavitation bubbles. We'll look at examples of each, some of the best examples from the, from the web. The electrolysis gaps, gas and narrow gaps that have a rough surface. I thought the best example came from Paul Zagoras because he had the simplest means to make the plates. His plates were incredibly close together, 0.6 millimeters. He had to wire every plate as a wet cell. He stressed that when he roughened his plates with a media blaster, or a sand blaster, he said you had to put the blaster at 45 degree angle in order to make sharp edge craters. That makes a barbed crater, a barb lip crater. He said that was very important. We'll revisit that on, on a cavitating motor. Here's a photograph of his media blaster. And Paul uh, was one of the best producers of abundant gas coming from the electrolyzer. He, uh, he sold about seven before he got suppressed and shut down, but Water McNichols bought one and, and stuck a YouTube up. John, can we play this one? It's a short one. The uh, first experiment with a Paul cell sitting in two inches of uh, tap water uh, I'm going to turn the switch on. Uh, it's on and you can see the tremendous amount of uh, hydrogen and the bubbles that are coming off of it. It's just uh, phenomenal. That's it. I, I met Paul Zagoras on a trip, trip back east. And, um, Uh, he told me a little bit about the suppression story. What they, uh, what they said was, uh, you can't run these cars on water. He was run, run, running a car on, on this device. He said, because it, it'll, people will short the oil stocks and it'll, it'll wreck the economy. I go, oh, give me a break. You already wrecked the economy. You did it by the old fashioned way of greed and fraud. Don't go blaming some poor inventor. <laughs> Uh, he pulled a vacuum of venturi through his device. He could actually suck the water into his plates and immediately get the gas on, on his car. Uh, blowing air can cause turbulence and cavitation. Archie Blue has a famous patent and, and stories of running a car engine on it. Uh, the, the holes are not shown because it's a side view. He just blew air through the electrolyzer. Mechanical vibration can do it. Omasa discovered that it gets a very, very good high quality gas with me mechanical vibration. Uh, so working with a parallel plate electrolyzer, he jerks his, uh, his vibrator, has to jerk very fast to make the cavitation. And he stored the gas under pressure for two years. And I might add that he didn't store hydrogen. He makes it a point in this video that you don't store hydrogen. Your, your containment of storage should vent away the hydrogen because storing hydrogen is, is unsafe. When you look at this video and read the subtitles, keep the cavitation hypothesis in mind. Tokyo Otaku no front maker, Nihon Techno. Nihon Techno no Omasa Shachou ga kaihatsu shita kono kakuhanki. Jyurai no yona propeller ga kaiten suru mono dewa naku. 
低周波の振動で攪拌する中の水は安定して循環するという洗剤を入れても泡が全く立たない一体なぜか通常電気分解すると酸素と水素が発生するしかし大政社長が過去にこの攪拌機を使ってメッキをしたところ難点とされる大きな泡や水素の爆発が発生しなかった振動が伝わってるために表面張力が壊れてですね泡が形成しようとっても壊れちゃうんですねだから泡は作りたくても作れない状態がこの現象じゃないかというふうに言われてるんですねこれをヒントにした大政社長水に電気を流すと白い煙のようなものがこれは酸水素ガス普通の電気分解だと水素と酸素のガスが別々に出てくるこのガスは振動拡拌器でないと得られない酸素と水素のガスがですね元素がナノマイクロバブルになって出るところが従来のですね電気分解と全く違うんですねそしてあと安全な酸素と水素の私の考えでは結合体のガスが得られると水素ガスは分子が細かいため容器などに保存しても漏れやすいしかしこのガスは2年近く同じ圧力で保存されている大政社長は酸素と水素2つの分子が結合し特殊な構造を作っているからだと考えるガスの用途はまずバーナーの燃料だ温度はおよそ700度で火の中では低い方だが鉄板を切断できるほどのエネルギーに変わるというさらに新たな用途も生まれようとしている東京海洋大学の伊藤教授7月に酸水素ガスを用いてある実験を成功させた、うん、タンクに貯めた酸水素ガスを燃料に小型エンジンを動かすことができた空気の取り込み口は塞いでいるガスの中に酸素があるため燃焼時に空気中の酸素が必要ないからだ水からできた燃料のため燃焼後はまた水に戻り有害な排ガスは発生しないという非常に安定な圧力を加えても爆発しないインフラとして整備して自由に給油でと同じように給ガスができるようなあの状況が作れればあの自動車の燃料として置き換わる可能性というのは十分にあって。ガスの正体を調べようと大政社長は液化を試みた酸素はマイナス183度水素はマイナス253度で液化するがこのガスはおよそマイナス178度で液化した構造はわからないにしても新しい、えー、地球上でその水の第二の水ができたエンジンとか発電機だとかあ今あの化石燃料に変わるものが水から作れてまた水に戻るというふうに、えー、究極のね、えー、地球を救うね、えー、燃料ですよね全ての燃料にしたい解明できていない部分が多い酸水素ガスだが大きな可能性を秘めている Um, oscillating electric field, as soon as you have any charged、uh, clusters or, or even charged bubbles, they'll oscillate with the field.、Uh, the exogen is my best example for that. Exogen power was done in Canada. Our lead、uh, inventor and scientist was Stephen Barry Chambers. Stephen Barry Chambers' sister was Marilyn Chambers, and Marilyn Chambers was the wife of Stan Myers. After Stan Myers' death, She took the material up to her brother and they found an exogen power. He has a patent.、Uh, the three patents are identical, other than adjustments to the claims, and there was only one thing unusual about his patent. 
And that was under the water, there's a toroidal coil. And you go, why in the world would you put that under the water? He thought that while the magnetic field will make para-hydrogen, because the gas I get burns better in a, in a Honda generator compared to when I don't use it. However, the magnetic field stays in the toroid. It doesn't come out of the toroid, so it can't be the magnetic field. Furthermore, they never measured the gas to see if it was para-hydrogen. Uh, but what does come from the toroid, an oscillating magnetic field creates an oscillating vector potential, which creates an oscillating E field in a torus shape, right around, out in the water, right around the coil. And any charge clusters simply can oscillate with us, causing turbulence and thus causing more cavitation. Uh, we can do it sonics and ultrasonics. The best example I found was uh, Freddie Wells is very controversial because of the suppression and the stories, but presumably he got his thing so well running, he was able to run a Dodge truck on the thing strictly from the gas. Uh, he stressed to, that these pipes have to oscillate acoustically, which is a difficult thing to do because the the diameter difference of the outer pipe and the inner pipe, the inner pipe has to be longer. He has to cut them so they all ring at the same acoustical frequency. That's going to be the drive frequency of his pulse modulator. And that, that's a difficult thing to do, but boy, when he does it, he gets a sh large amount of gas. And, it, and then in the future ones, he says, I'm going to use ultrasonics in the future. Uh, cavitating pumps, as well as vor vortexes in water, likewise produce cavitating bubbles. Uh, James Griggs is famous in the 90s. He has the hydrosonic pump that pr produced hot water. He was claiming from measurements that he was over unity. He had 130% efficiency, but he had to back off those claims uh, to make the device commercial because people were calling him a fraud. So he backed off the claims, just said, I'm highly efficient. And a, when you read the patent, you'll realize there's barb edges on the lips of his holes, and he drills bore holes that are countersunk to produce vortex action in the holes. So that's how he produces a cavitation with his rotor. Uh, perhaps the first free energy device ever that may have worked was from John Keeley. And he uh, made, made it based on water hammer 10 years before water hammer was even recognized as existing in the scientific community. And those bulbs there would, would be called pulsating chambers could produce vortex flow in the water. Dale Palm's website's great uh, but for his attempts to bring Keeley's worth forward and um, replicate, he tries to replicate Keeley's devices. Victor Schauberger is famous for the water vortex experiment. He claimed uh, some excess energy device from this water jet turbine. Look at the shape of that turbine down at the bottom. It's similar to the Richard Clem device, who was doing likewise, but using cooking oil as working fluid. And this machine presumably was self-running. Uh, Dan Winter has a wonderful educational website for, for this, this these energetics, and he thinks that the vortex flow from, from water it energizes the water, and there's a vortex imploder shower head they have for sale. Sterling Allen wrote in his Peswicky News uh, about uh, Re Andrea Rapato's uh, work in Italy, where he has a company called Biocavitation. When they cavitate, they're looking to energize the water to enhance plant growth, water purification. Uh, even claims of nuclear remediation. He gave uh, Sterling a Venturi showerhead, right, that makes a squeal as it pushes out the water. Keep that idea of a water flow showerhead in mind when we look at the electrolyzers. Circulating the water does three great things. It cavitates, it can cause cavitation, it charges it by electrostatic rubbing, and it also allows you to recirculate to keep reintegrating the energy content of the water. Uh, Provenslick has a seminal paper on the web called Bubbles and Steam Electricity, where he, where he explains steam electricity, waterfall ionization, sun and luminescence, and thunder charge cloud separation with a zero point model involving the cavitation bubbles. If Provenslick is correct, it means that lightning has is sourced from the zero-point energy itself. 
I know thundercloud dynamics, the grapple or its tiny ice crystals are blown up by the wind, it falls down, it circulates, and it's very much like a Van de Graaff generator, where we have the, the insulator belt rubbing against the combs, sharp combs, and here we're going to let water, distilled water, be the insulator, it acts like the dielectric belt, when it rubs up against the rough conductive plates, they act like the combs. We're making a Van de Graaff generator by circulating water. Uh, here's one embodiment of the idea where we circulate the water across the bottom. Uh, you go as fast as you can with the pump. Uh, it creates a lot of turbulence in the electrolyzer, and then the gas comes off. Another embodiment is where we put the reservoir at the top, then the gas itself, that's, and we circulate through the electrolyzer completely, the gas itself helps push the water up. So you, the pump doesn't have to work as hard as it pushes the water up. It bubbles out of the reservoir. We use the spark arresters to keep any backflash from igniting the gas that's coming out. You could use a cavitating pump if you want, or let the plates themselves cause the cavitation by recavitation because the gaps are so small. So this embodiment does all three, does everything, does the circulation, does the rubbing. You get the plates to vibrate like the reeds of a harmonica, right? And wow, well, this is the cavit, I believe this is the winning embodiment because it combines all the ideas. So what's the goal? We make these devices and we make a self-running system. With that, we can prove we have a new energy source. Self-running system, you have the electrolyzer making the gas, it runs a gen set, a motor generator combination. You use the electricity from the generator to drive your electronics if you're doing a pulse wave modulator, drive a pump if you're circulating. And what you want to show is that you have more energy out that, than you put in, therefore you can make it self-running. You can use a battery to kickstart it, but the goal is to make it self-running. Uh, two, two, oh, here's our action item for the inventors make the closed loop self-running system, prove there's a new energy source, and then share the information on the web. Two teams have actually succeeded. Uh, Steve Eaton and Jeff Sokol teamed up in HyberTech, and then they came out, I think it was in 2009, announcing that they ran a Troy-built generator uh, with the electrolyzer, only producing six liters per minute of uncompressed gas. Um, there's a picture of it. I have more pictures. Here's the six inch uh, prototype, very tight gap, 1 32nd of an inch, using concentric cylinders. Here's the wiring diagram of the, of, of the pipes. Basically, uh, we're charging uh, three, three banks in parallel, like they were capacitors, and then they're connected in series, so we have a four, four volt drop in between the, the electrodes. Um, he had, he kept the electrodes separated by a mono spiral filament. Kind of reminds me of fishing line. It was very, very thin for that thin gap. You can see it a little better here. And you see the spiral up? Well, that spiral forces the water gas to spiral up and keep rubbing against, against the, the, the uh, electrodes. Uh, he decided he had to make a big one because he would, that's how he would get the over unit effect. He thought he had to make a big one. But had he realized th that you could recirculate the water and keep charging it, uh, he may have gotten away with using the little one. Team out of Germany, Oliver and Valentine, they're pure hobbyists. Uh, they work with a very, very cheap generator. They were on a very strict budget. They had to jerry rig it to change the timing on it, you can see. Uh, but nonetheless, by working with a very good cell, the Anton cell, they were able to make this device self-running. Uh, they put it on a cart. Um, uh, they took it on an elevator ride on the hand cart, rode on the elevator for about eight minutes. They came up with their big Christmas video, I think, in 2010. And they felt it was going to change the world. And so Stefan Hartman uh, made a fun, a fun video of splicing their video with the old 1984 Apple commercial. And it makes a fun finale. <laughs>
Jim Sessa. Uh, to summarize the high points of the electrolyzer, it should be rough, clean surface, small gaps are the best, causes turbulence and cavitation. The electrical stimulation can be pulse waveforms. You want to minimize your current and thus minimize your electrolyte. We're not trying to do electrolysis. We are not trying to make hydrogen. And frictional rubbing is a great way to charge it via circulation. Uh, and cavitation, the cavitation bu bubble collapses into a re-entrant jet, which forms the water crystal. We can get that thing into a closed loop. We have our stable torus of Rydberg matter that stores the co energy coherently. And if it can produce transmutation, then uh, Mark Leclerc gets to name it after himself because it's, it, it changes the world, if this is true. Uh, so how to cavitate. Electrolysis gas in the narrow gaps. That's how everybody do is doing it. They're doing it inadvertently. They didn't realize they're trying to cavitate. They just know narrow gaps work great. Blowing air through, event, pulling a venturi vacuum, all sort, any type of vibration, mechanical, acoustical, sonic, ultrasonic, and electrical fields. Any oscillating electrical field will cause any charge clusters to oscillate. Circulation, we charge it by rubbing. We create more turbulence and cavitation when we circulate. If we can get the plates vibrating, like a shower massage, and recavitation gives us a great electrolyzer. And by recycling the water into the reservoir and back through, we keep, we keep increasing the energy content of the water. And then if you increase it enough, you can take some of that water, spray some mist into a carburetor of a motorbike, and give the illusion that water is a fuel. Here's our action items. Chemistry departments, make Brown's gas, vent away the hydrogen. What's remaining? What is that gas that burns that remains? Physics departments. Repeat Leclerc's transmutation experiment. Measure the new isotopes. And inventors, make a self-running system with electrolyzers and generators. Don't worry about the cars yet, because once we convince the engineers we have a new energy source, uh, it'll be a cakewalk to retrofit cars. So the most important thing from the inventors is share the information on the web to make a new world. Thank you. I feel like I've been drinking from the fire hose. Anybody else? Do you know how many years of research and how many months of effort went into preparing this presentation? Maury has been on the phone with me regularly for the past month and a half, almost two months working on this. He has put so much effort in there, so much, this is so dynamite. This is, this is packed with so much energy. This has more than C4. There's more energy in this. <laughs> it, it, this may even have more than HHO in it. You know, <laughs> yeah, the, um, we have, well, we have time to entertain a couple of questions. Absolutely, and uh, let, me give, uh, let me give an afterword here. Uh, when I started this research uh, in the 70s, uh, this Taurus form business, uh, I, I had these dreams. Other people I ran into it. It was like, I called it donuts on the brain. It's like the good Lord was trying to convert us all into Homer Simpsons. And of course, here's the latest incarnation of that. We saw that last night. A word from our sponsors. The books are over there in the Tesla bookstore. And perhaps the most important thing, how can you get a copy of this slideshow? This slideshow is up on the web already at uh, the same site that all the other ones are up. This is annotated so it stands alone. All the speaker comments are in there. All you have to do is Google water fuel ZPE. It's very important that uh, everybody download a copy so that uh, it can be reposted if, if anybody tries to remove this information. So now, any questions? Yes, that's all in the DVD. Uh, we have time for a couple of questions. The first person I would like to bring over is someone that was actually on the presentation. This is Vernon Roth. Uh, Mark, Murray, could I make uh, a little bit of a footnote to make uh, about some things? Okay, um, when he showed the, 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 the Brown's gas torch um, going through his hand, 
The reason why that happens is because the, the, the gases are actually quite literally punching a hole through the air. And when you run your hand through it, it doesn't have time to punch a hole through your hand. That's why you can actually run your hand across the flame. Thank you. Appreciate that. And I tried this because, yes, I am insane. You can actually burn yourself with Brown's gas. You, it, it does work. <laughs> Yeah. The, the reason why it does not boil water is because the water itself quenches the implosive action of the flame. And that's why it will not boil water, and that's, that's uh, one, of the, uh, one of the reasons why. Now, um, I want to uh, reaffirm also that what he said about um, limiting the current is absolutely essential. Um, what I have found in all of my hydrogen research, which is, which is pretty, pretty uh, fun stuff, is that... <clears throat> The more energy you put into it, the less energy you get out. Absolutely, 100% of the time, the more energy you put in, the less energy you get out. So if you can do it with a minimal amount or any other means, of, uh, any other means possible, literally the electrolysis breaks down the gases that uh, Moray is talking about here. So the less energy in, the more energy in the gas you'll find. And, and lastly, this is really exciting, because I'm not speaking this year, so I just have to throw this out. The toroids, um, astrophysicists have recently discovered <clears throat> the birth of, they've actually seen the birth of the most young suns that ever documented. They are literally water-based toroids that are collapsing into plasma. Our sun is literally a giant ball of water that is collapsing over and over and over again as plasma and we see it in this spectrum. Whereas in, uh, in incredibly far distances, we're actually able to see that, that it is a plasma that is, it, it, forms into a, uh, it forms into a toroid, collapses, releases energy, and it's igniting itself into a plasma. So the, what we're seeing here is the birth of Genesis, and it, it's a beautiful thing. Thanks a lot, Moray. Well, thank you, Barry. Uh, better than sliced bread, better than, I mean, this is a breakthrough, killer gangbusters. Uh, first of all, this, one of the things this explains is why close gaps are so good, because you want to have an enormous electrostatic field, and this is another reason why uh, rough surfaces are good. And uh, when you have that electrostatic uh, flux, the water is going to want to make uh, eddy currents, so suddenly you've got an eddy current, and you've got a huge electrostatic gradient because of the point. So suddenly, that toroid can be a collapsing monopole. I mean, you know, you'll have a magnetic field going around, electrostatic field going through. Uh, about 10 years ago, I interviewed at a company in uh, Grass Valley, California, called um, uh, 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 Impulse Technologies. And they were making spheres that were about a foot across, and they were about two inches thick, and they make them in halves, and they bring them together, and they'd electrostatically weld them around the outside. Butt-kicking sphere, basically speaking. And they had a couple of penetrations, and they excited it so that it was basically the spherical wave. And they pumped this thing for, you know, about 20 minutes, and all of a sudden, bang, it'd capitate, and they get all this weird stuff that was happening on the inside. And they never even got a clue that they were getting this style of cavitation. Bravo. Oh, thank you. Oh. This is easy. I didn't have to answer anything yet. <laughs> My name is Harvey Fiala. <clears throat> I'm absolutely amazed at the amount of knowledge you bring to this presentation. It's, it's amazing. But one, one question. <clears throat> you mentioned like tungsten vaporizes at 10,000 degrees plus. When, it, when your arc uh, cuts it, is it cool or is it boiling hot? Good question. Finally, <laughs> the, uh, the answer is when it reacts with, with the metal. And I think when Ken Shoulder's studies probably explained it the best. So, so it's, we have coherent energy stored. It's reacting with the metal, the electrons in the metal. Okay? It drives them into a higher energy state. When they collapse back, that's what produces the heat. So as they collapse back in the metal form, that's when the metal glows. Now we're, now we're getting heat. It requires the interaction of that gas or that flame with the metal to, make it ha to get high temperatures. So, so the metal stays cool? No. Or no, it gets, 
So you don't we, have we, we actually broke the electron bonds very easily. We had a hand raised in the back here, but, Maureen. But you don't dare touch it when it, you cut it, right? I wouldn't. Okay. Uh, by the way, I wouldn't pass my hand through an acetylene torch either because they, they call you stubby. Can, can, can I make a comment on that one too? Go ahead. Uh, I, I, was, I, was cutting a, I was cutting a piece of metal, a tubular piece of metal. And what was really amazing about this, uh, about cutting with a Brown's gas flame, is that while you are actually cutting, while the, the flame is going through the metal, all of the heat is localized right around the cut right around that point. And then as soon as you're done, as soon as, the, as soon as the flame moves away from that metal, that's when the heat spreads out. And boy howdy, that one got me. <laughs> because I was experimenting with that. And when, it, when, it, uh, when, the, when the Brown's gas was removed, then the heat propagated through the entire rod that I was cutting. And, and, and the entire rod just went from, from being holdable in your hand to being Second degree burns instantly. Good, good safety tip. Cautionary tale. Yeah. Oh, one, one quick side note. Uh, when it comes to hydrogen research, another silent giant is this giant standing behind me. It's also our PM, Don Kuntz. You should see some of the toys, I mean the tools that he has in his garage. And uh, some of the test equipment and the hydrogen that he's got. Uh, actually, those two are co-conspirators, Vernon Roth and uh, those two. Uh, they they uh, they get into trouble together. I mean, uh, research. Yeah, the more the merrier. We want we need numbers. The goal is one million inventors with self-running generators. To sh you, know, you can't suppress that. Doctor Ed Bedrow, Ph.D. Chemistry and Physics has just published a book in July supporting exactly what Vernon was talking about. And it is how to create every element from water. The tables, the energy equations, and the physics are all in this book. Dr. Ed Bedreau was professor of the year a couple of times taught at the University of New Orleans. This book was just published this month. There is a complimentary copy for you. There'll be one out on the stand, and you can order copies of the book because it lays out just how this earth was created, how creation is occurring in the universe, all from water. If you want to make gold, <laughs> just read the book. <laughs> no, because you'll drop the price of gold. <laughs> by, by the way, which shows the, the only investment of wealth is each other. That's our true wealth. Exactly. And uh, if you have uh, gold fever, and some of us know from experience about gold fever, uh, you go the way of all things. <laughs> Praise God, because the secret is in creating every element from water. And the energy, uh, Kazumo, you probably read, maybe read his paper. It was the thing that convinced me there was really something to this other than what Faraday said. And fortunately, he explained it very well today. You, you did stand all kinds of credit to you. But he showed that not only can you make every element from water, you can make water from water. Oh, that's handy. <laughs> and actually, when you disassociate the water, that uh, Japanese paper proved that you get 16 times more water than you disassociated. Exactly. And if you look at it from that standpoint, <clears throat> to get the water, you have to burn it. The energy is the byproduct of creating more water. Enough said. You got time for one more. Yeah, hi, Dr. King. Uh, yeah, when you create the Brown's gas, are there any um, 
like safety issues in particular is radioactivity created that would give the government kind of an excuse to suppress it you know on safety concerns if well, you get the gist of my question well, the government doesn't need an excuse to suppress it <laughs> it's just well, without an excuse but of course of course, when there, there are safety, safety concerns, if we're, if we're working with energy in, in this concentrated form, uh, energy's energy, right? So of course there's, there's concerns. And uh, that's, why, that's why you don't want to foolishly, for example, if you don't know that you have the pure gas and you have hydrogen, you certainly don't want to store that under pressure if you have hydrogen, right? So you, you have to be smart. The people that know how to store it say, I'm venting that hydrogen. I, my containment will be porous to hydrogen if I choose to store this gas under pressure. So people that do the storage and, and build up a little bit of, of pressure, you know, 30, 50 PSI, will work with very weak containment. And even if that should explode, it's like a milk container or something. And you don't make too much. You just make what you need. But the answer is, of course, it's dangerous. But, but are the radioactive byproducts created? Maybe. Because uh, Mark LeClaire was warning about that. He said, uh, if you're getting super nucleosynthesis, then you're all over the place. And we're, just, to, just to produce that, if that's produced, right, that changes the world if, it re if people replicate that. Because you're forced to be confronted with uh, zero point energy. There's really no energy with that type of concentration that could affect the nucleus. And unfortunately, you're all, likewise, the reason why it's ignored in the West, uh, the, even the plasmoid strikes which are very repeatable. It implies that there's a different model of the nucleus than, simple, than just simply the quark theory, which the Russians are definitely willing to entertain as they dive into what's going on with those experiments. So the, the answer is, of course, I, I think it's very important to, to uh, be safe and use common sense uh, as you uh, do these experiments. Ladies and gentlemen, a warm round of applause for the king. Yes. The king is